I really wanted to specifically to make this film, and um, there was even at some points discussions as to whether we would try and do this first, um, because I was still working on Submarine. It just ended up that the, the script for this took a lot longer, and it was more, I guess, more complicated in a way. The narrative was just took a long time to work out a suitable form for it that we felt was good. So, yes, I, I really wanted to make this, and and certainly after making Submarine, I, I really hoped I'd be able to, you know, make another film. I took my jacket off only because it's so hot, not because I mistook the office for a brothel. Excellent job. That's the type of initiative we need. How long have you been here, son? Just started, eh? Yes, sir, seven years ago. The start of this particular film was the... Um, Arvi Kareen, who I ended up writing with, it was his idea to adapt the Dostoevsky novella. And one of the issues with it is that it's a very high concept proposition, which is that a doppelganger appears, and that's a kind of fantastical, impossible thing to occur. And it's so strong, you know, where does it go? How does it unravel? And, and in general, in mythological terms, if you see your doppelganger, you die. You know, there's a certain way it pans out. And how to do that and how to keep it interesting or surprising felt um, hard. Also, partly, you know, Dostoevsky was dissatisfied with the ending of his book. So that became like a, a big block. You know, how can we possibly end something that he was unable to, but in a way what we really did was take the premise of the book, which is that someone so lonely and um, put upon and invisible and unremarkable that an exact replica of them could appear and no one would notice, like that premise we just thought was brilliant. Harris, have you spoken to the new employee? James? Yeah, sure, I mean him. And? He seems all right. But did you notice anything strange about him? I mean, did he remind you of anyone? No. No one at the office? No. Okay. The love story isn't present in the novella. Um, and in a way, yes, it provided for us the solution um, of how to end the story about what the, the thrust of it should be, because the novella is hard to follow, or I certainly find it hard to follow. It's in the third person, but it feels like it's inside his head, and it's kind of a spiral into madness. And, you know, very innovative in its style and kind of prefigures Kafka and Jungianism and, you know, it's, but it's quite heady. It's very difficult to know where you are. It changes location in a sentence. It's, it's very um, dense. So we wanted, I guess, something that was clearer in a way and, and more centered on a relationship, whereas in the novel, it really is a character very much on their own, going, you know, cooking in their own head. Doppelganger story, inevitably, it's partially about this idea of the divided self, and I guess what is taken up in the idea of the, the shadow, the, the Jungian idea of the shadow, and that what you can't accept about yourself if it's not in any way dealt with, will out in some way that you, that people are flawed and, and that is something that has to be accepted and it's, it's maddening to think that you're not, you know, it's kind of a path to craziness to think that the world is wrong and you're right. It's like I'm permanently outside myself. Like, like you could push your hand straight through me if you wanted to. And I couldn't see the type of man that I want to be versus the type of man I actually am. And I know that I'm doing it, but I'm incapable of doing what needs to be done. The actors are the most important thing, I, I, I think, in a film. And until they're there and until they're doing it, you can't have too set an idea. I mean, in some ways, storyboards are partially for art department and to know how much set to build and, you know, just a sense of you having at least thought through the visual language of it before you um, are shooting. But I'd never tell an actor where to stand or where to, you know, you see what they do and what they're interested in and then you adapt it around them. Jesse plays these very different parts without really altering his appearance a great deal. And because the premise of the film required that the two characters don't 
look dissimilar in any way. In fact, they have to look identical and dress identically. We needed someone who's able to animate them internally and make them look different. And to the extent that when we were editing the film, if you had a freeze frame of Jesse, you could instantly tell which character he was playing just from his attitude. And, you know, I really think of his age, I can't think of anyone who has his range or his ability. Do you still have eggs here? Yeah. And do you have a frying pan? Yeah. Then do me a favor and make me some scrambled eggs. Fine. Anything else? Bacon. Bacon. And toast. And toast. And a beer. And a beer. Anything else? No, that's it. Are you sure? Just give me the damn food. With the technical aspects of it, what's so good about Jesse is that he's able to combine this um, complete precision of timing, because with the motion control and the split screen, the way it works is that you record one performance and then he has to w wear an earpiece into which the selected take is played of that first performance and then act against that and match eye lines and play it in the precise say, same rhythm as he did before. And that's almost against all of the instincts of an actor to be in the moment and feel that you're responding naturally, but he's able to you know, meet the technical demands while being emotionally engaged, and that's very rare, I, I feel. I think this is a good thing. We'll make a date, and you can go as me. I'll give you a little more coaching. Do you think that's even ethical? Uh, <laughs> don't think this the wrong way, but I think it's unlikely you'll be able to get into an unethical situation on a first date. Unethical. That's very sweet. There's a thing that Kubrick said that he didn't feel that a truly original mind could work in cinema because it's just a classical medium now. There's a certain grammar to it, but I guess you're always trying to think of something to do with the way you're showing it or, or the camera or where you put the camera precisely that conveys a feeling and um, particularly in a film that's subjective and I, I really like films that have a kind of subjective point of view because I feel that it's very difficult to see what a character seeing in other mediums as directly you can you know, in a novel, you can see how a character would describe something or you can observe how they talk. But actually seeing something through someone's eyes, there's something just very direct about, you know, Vertigo. There's something just very direct about Scotty's gaze and what he sees and how instant that is. Um, and that's something that's, yeah, very appealing to me and how how interesting editing is and juxtaposing two images and creating something that can only exist because of the two things that precede it and how it exists in time and all of those things are, you know, fascinating to me. Sir, I have been through all of this in the report. I, I think maybe he needs some help. He's gone a little crazy. Look at me! Look at me! Look at him! He stole my face! I feel that any film is a fake world by the very virtue of how things are seen and that you're being presented something via a lens, which is just not how people look at things. And when you see people's eyes, they're constantly fidgeting and uh, making a million adjustments and constructing a kind of reality, whereas you've suddenly got a fixed point of view and you're deciding the rhythm of... So just the space of it is impossible. I mean, I always find it strange when people decide that something's either realistic or a surreal film because, to me, the weirdest thing is that you can show someone's face in a close-up and then cut to another person's face instantaneously, which is an... Imp you can't see that. It's impossible. But that's normal. But, you know, if someone's phone is four inches too big, you go, that's a pretty weird world. So, in a way, I think all films really are non-real spaces because they're non-real time and they're non-real things and they, they're primarily just stories. <laughs>